Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. And it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would, please. We've been sharing with you on the subject of, so far, about God's call, the call on every New Testament believer, the call of God on your life. And we brought forth two sessions on that. Today, we're going to talk about, are you one who is chosen by God? Are you going to be chosen by God? We begin with Matthew 20, verse 16, where it says, The last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Not everybody that's called is chosen, because not everybody is responding to the call of God. Not everybody is meeting the conditions that are necessary to be chosen, even though they've been called. It's important that we realize what the Word of God says, and we're going to be talking about it tonight because we want to be one of the chosen of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we begin here in verse 2, where it says, as newborn babes, when someone gets born again, their newborn babe, desire, or this means to long for, the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. We need to get in the Word of God. You need to get in the Word of God and continue to feed upon the Word of God every day of your life so that you will grow spiritually. The Word of God is doing something in you every time you are hearing it. And as you take hold of it and apply it and do it in your life, you're going to see the fruit come forth. See here, we, if we tasted the Lord is gracious, to whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Who's the one that's chosen of God who is precious? Jesus. Jesus came. You also, as lively stones, which you and I are when we're born again, living stones in the house of God, are built up, or this really means, not that the fact that it's already been accomplished. When you look at this, you find it's in the present tense, which means it is continuous, repeated, ongoing action. The tenses are very important to understand what's being said. And it literally says, are being built up, showing the process a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you've got to understand, you have a responsibility to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. That's why you need to be praising and worshiping God with everything within you and ministering to Him. That's part of the spiritual sacrifices that we are to offer up to Him. Wherefore also is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect. The word elect is this word, Lectos, which is the word for chosen, one who's been chosen, one who is precious or honored and held in high honor. This is the Lord Jesus. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He will not be dishonored or disgraced. Instead, he will see God manifest himself in his life. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto to them that dis are disobedient, or really this doesn't mean disobedient, but ones who have been in unbelief or refused to believe, literally, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. That's Jesus. He's the cornerstone. You and I are stones in the house of God. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, or this again means disbelieving, unbelieving, whereunto also they were appointed. He goes on and says, but you are a chosen generation. We have, are a chosen generation, chosen by God, legally from his standpoint, because we are in Christ when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, a royal priesthood, that's a ruling, reigning priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You and I are a chosen generation. We are to be those who are to be chosen by God. You are chosen legally, but there are conditions that you will see that are important for you to see that you are going to be chosen of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians, it says over in chapter 2, verse 13, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he says, We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Every one of us have been chosen to salvation. Through sanctification of the Spirit, we get a brand new spirit, and we're born again. 
and belief of the truth. We got to believe the truth. We got to believe the gospel if we're going to see Jesus bring forth the new birth in our life. We see another scripture speaking of how this has been from the very beginning in Ephesians chapter 1 over here in verse 3 where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. When it talks about him choosing us, this is the verb form, and this means, it's in the aorist tense and the middle voice. This means, because it's the middle voice, the middle voice means the subject is doing the action for himself. It means he has chosen us for himself. You've been chosen for the Lord in him before the foundation of the world. This is what his purpose is for everyone. And what are we supposed to be? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God's called you to be holy. He's called you to be without blame. What kind of a church is Jesus coming back for? One that's holy, without blame, without blemish, unspotted, unrebukable, unreprovable. You've been called to holiness. You've been called to walk in his ways without blame before him in love, as we see. He says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. This has all been determined from the day, from foundation of time, as it said back here, from the foundation of the world, that this is what his purpose is for all of us, what he chooses for all of us. But we got to be sure that we do what he says if we're going to see that manifest experientially in our life. In John chapter 15, we see in verse 14, he makes a statement. He says, you are my friends if, notice if, that means you're not automatically a friend, it's only if, you do whatsoever I command you. You must obey the commands of the New Testament. As you obey the commands of the New Testament, then you will be a friend of God. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. See, those who are his friends are going to get revelation from him of all of his ways. He says, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And again, this is in the middle voice, indicating the fact that he's chosen us for himself. And ordained you, or placed you, and set you, that you should go and bring forth fruit. Now, when it talks about you going and bringing forth fruit, but the word there for go as well as the word for bring forth, is present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated action, so that you are to be continually going forth. And the subjunctive mood indicates that this is something that's conditional. Otherwise, bringing forth fruit is not automatic. It's all conditional upon you doing what the word says. The subjunctive mood in the Greek means that it is conditional upon conditions being met that they are met and it expresses things that are contrary to fact. It's not a fact. That you might go, it says, or you may go because it's in the present tense, and that you may bring forth fruit, that is if you do what the Word says, that your fruit should remain. This is the Greek word meno, remain, abide, continue. Your fruit is to remain, otherwise you shouldn't have fruit one minute and then later on you don't have any fruit. That shows you've drawn back from the Word. You haven't continued in the Word of God, been a true disciple. So God wants you to understand that as one who is going to be called of God and be chosen of Him, you're to bring forth fruit. And your fruit is to remain. But it's all conditional upon you doing what the Word says so that your, the fruit will abide in you. In fact, it's supposed to increase and abound in your life. We see down here in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. If you're going to be one chosen by God and you've been chosen out of the world, how can you walk in the ways of the world? You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in God and think you're going to be chosen of him. No way. He tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we must turn away from the ways of the world. We must choose to walk in the way of the Lord. You cannot compromise, because if you compromise and you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. 
James 4.4 4 says, you adulterers and adulteresses. This isn't talking about sexual things. This is talking about spiritual adulterer and a spiritual adulteress. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, he is an enemy of God. and He's actually a spiritual adulterer and a spiritual adulteress before God. God, he's a jealous God. He's not going to have, you're not going to have any other gods before him if you're going to be right with God and chosen of him and walking in his ways. So we must come out of the ways of the world if we're going to be one that's going to be chosen by the Lord. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we see something here in verse 4. In fact, we back up to verse 3. It says, You're to therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You and I are to be soldiers in the army of the Lord. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You have been chosen to be a soldier. That means you've got to get into the fight. You've got to get into fighting the good fight of faith and warring the good warfare and get into casting out demons, get into warfare intercession, and get into the spiritual battle. If you won't engage in the spiritual battle, you're not going to be fulfilling what God has called you to be. You are to be a soldier. You've been chosen, or actually this word here where he chooses you this, it's a word which actually means to be enlisted. It doesn't want to come up there for some reason. Here it is. To enlist. To enlist you as a soldier. You've been enlisted. You say, no, oh, I didn't know I was in the army of the Lord. You've been enlisted by the Lord. When you got born again, you are now in the army of the Lord. You are to be a soldier. Well, you've got to take your place. You've got to rise up and become uh, one who's going to get the word of God in you and know your authority and rise up and begin to war good warfare and fight the good fight of faith and do the things that God has commanded you to do. So you're going to be chosen if you're going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. Now again, we cannot have our eyes upon the things of this world. Instead, we've got to be totally submitted to the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see over here in verse 5, here, this is where the the children of Israel, they were saying unto Samuel here, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted a king. They wanted to be judged like the nations. They didn't like being judged by the prophet, which was being judged by God. They wanted to be judged by the nations, which wasn't being judged by God. They didn't want to submit to God any longer. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they've not rejected thee, but they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You must let the Lord reign over you. He must be truly Lord of your life. Just like we've seen in the scripture, where why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? If he's really Lord, you're totally submissive to do all the things that he says in the word of God. He is to rule and reign over you. You're a purchased possession. You're bought with a price. You belong to him. You can't decide to do the things that you want to do. He goes on and says, According to all the works which they've done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, wherefore they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. That's why they wanted to go after a king for the nation, from the, from the rule them like the nations, because they didn't want to submit to the Lord's rulership in their life. Well, so now therefore hearken to their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. He began to show them all the evil things that the king would do. We come down to verse 18. And one of the things he said to them, is says, you're going to cry out in that day, because of all the evil the king's going to do to you, because of your king, which you shall have chosen, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. When you choose the things that don't please God, and then you call upon God to get you out of the jam that you got in because you weren't choosing the way of the Lord and letting him rule and reign over you, he's not going to be listening. He's not going to hear you until you come to the place of repentance and get right with him. He said, the Lord's not going to hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, but we'll have a king over us. And it's even revealing further, they did not only did not want the Lord's reign over their life, but the next verse says, that we also may be like the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. 
Not only did they not want anybody to tell them what to do and rule over them, they didn't want to fight any longer. They didn't want to fight their battles. Well, the same thing is true today. If you won't let Jesus Christ be Lord over your life, you're not going to be chosen of Him. You also, if you won't enter into the fight and fight the spiritual battles, you won't be chosen of Him either. Many people don't want to enter into the fight. You need to fight the spiritual fight against the enemy. You are in a warfare because you are here. You're going to be in a warfare all the days of your life, not only working out your own salvation, but also helping others to work out theirs and being an intercessor and casting out demons and going out and doing the mighty works of the Lord. Well, God wants us to be sure that we choose the things that He says for us to choose, because if we'll choose what He says, then we'll be chosen of Him. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, we see down here in verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Notice, it has a herited, inherited generational effect, doesn't it? Because the blessings come down the line, but also the curses will come down the line. So you can choose life and blessing, or you can choose the way of death or cursing. You see, things come because of a reason. In fact, the Bible says all the curses have a cause. The curse causeless shall not come. There's a cause for every curse. It's because of wrong choices that have been made, which has allowed the enemy to work, and that's why the curse has come. So we need to be choosing the things that God wants us to choose. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God when you choose his way, that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. <coughs> so you're going to love the Lord, you're going to obey his voice, you're going to cleave unto him, stick unto him, if you choose the right thing. He's thy life, the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land. That means to possess the promised land, which is a type of you possessing your spiritual promised land, which are the promises of God in your life, which the Lord swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. That's talking about the covenant. All the covenant promises which have been given to you now in the New Testament, they will come in manifestation in your life if you choose the right thing. If you choose to truly obey him and love the Lord your God, obey his voice, cleave unto him and then he will bring those promises into being in your life. Over in Joshua, we see in chapter 24, Joshua 24 and verse 15, he says this, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Every one of us, we're making a choice who we're going to serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got to make the decision that you and your house are going to serve the Lord. You're going to put the Word of God first place, and you're going to obey everything that He tells you to do. The people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He it is that brought us up and our, out of, and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and that did those great signs in our sight and preserved us all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. Otherwise, they were going to make the right choice and choose to serve the Lord. you got to make the same right choice. You don't put the Word of God first place in your household. You just kind of do whatever you want. You haven't chosen the way of the Lord. See, we can't be Christian in name and in not in deed, in action, carrying out the Word of God. We're going to choose to do what He says. Over in Psalms 119, Psalms 119, here in verse 30. Psalms 119, verse 30, he says this, I have chosen the way of truth. That's what you need to choose. What's the way of truth? The Word of God. Thy Word is truth. In the measure that you are a hearer and a doer of the Word is the measure that you've chosen the way of truth. Just because you've heard the Word doesn't mean you've chosen the way of truth. You've got to be a doer of the Word. You've got to continue in the Word. It's going to be evident, of course, by the fruit in your life, because if you hear and do the Word, you're going to have fruit. That's how you know people. Remember, he says you know them by their fruits. That's how you know everybody. You know whether they're walking in line with the Word of God or not. Over in verse 73, Thy hands have made me fashion me, made me and fashion me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. You and I are to learn the commandments of the Lord and fear the Lord and do what He tells us to do and walk in His ways, praise God. And be obedient, learn His statutes, choose the way of the Lord at all times in our life. Over in Proverbs, 
chapter 1. We see something. Beginning in verse 23, he says this. He says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit upon you. I'll make known my words unto you. Otherwise, we need to be correctable and receive the correction. If we ignore his correction, we don't hearken unto what he says. He won't make known his words to you. Because I've called and you refused, stretched out my hand, no man regarded. They wouldn't listen. You said it not all my counsel with none of my reproof. I'll laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your fear cometh. People wonder, wonder why God's not helping me in this situation. There was a reason. If we haven't been walking right, because God's not holding anything back from those that walk uprightly, but He will if we're not walking right before Him. It says He'll laugh at our calamity and mock when our fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, that's what the devil will bring. Then they'll call upon me and I'll not answer. They'll seek me early, but they'll not find me. Obviously, they haven't been chosen and approved of God. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. We need to love knowledge. That's why you've got to get the Word in you. You've got to be one who studies the Word and gets the knowledge of God. And you choose the fear of the Lord. If you choose the fear of the Lord, then you're going to turn away from all evil in your life. But they none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. So they're going to eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. God wants you to choose the fear of the Lord. And what is the fear of the Lord? It's not only the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, but also it says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If you have the fear of the Lord before it, you'll hate evil. That means you'll hate everything that's sin. You'll hate anything that would come into your mind that would be contrary to what God wants you to think upon. You'll hate anything that would come to you that would try to get you to walk contrary to the word or sin in any aspect in your life. You need to hate the evil. You know, whatever you hate, that's the last thing you're going to have. If there's something, let's say, to eat, and you hate to eat, that's the last thing you're going to put in your mouth, aren't you? You're not going to, nobody's going to get that in your mouth. Well, that's the same attitude we ought to have towards evil and towards sin. I hate that. I hate that lust. Do you hate that lust enough? If you hate that lust enough, you won't yield to it. You've got to hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves and turn away from areas of sin in your life. We can't be doing evil things. Anytime we do evil things, we're going to give place to the enemy. Talks about in Proverbs 3.31, Envy not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. We can't be walking in the ways of anything that is evil. This is someone who's been doing evil things, someone who's been choosing the wrong ways to oppress people, do evil things to them. That's why you can't be speaking evil words. Don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Only speak those things that are going to minister life. Speak those things that are going to minister good things. Don't do anything that's contrary to his word. Choose none of the ways of sin. Otherwise, you give place to the devil and curses will come upon you and evil spirits will come into you. Proverbs 16:16. 16, 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding, rather to be chosen, than silver? This part rather really isn't in there in, in, the, in the Hebrew. It says, like Young's brings it out very well, to get wisdom, how much better than gold, and to get understanding to be chosen than silver. In other words, we should be choosing to get understanding and wisdom instead of seeking after silver and gold and all these temporal things. The most important thing in your life is to get the knowledge of God, the understanding, and the wisdom so you walk in His ways. And when you do that, God will prosper you and bless you in all that you put your hand unto. We see over in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 15. Better, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Anything that's evil, refuse it. Don't even give place to it for a second. Choose the good. God wants you to choose the things that are good in his sight. By Isaiah chapter 56, he makes a statement down here. In verse 4, here he says, Thus saith the Lord and the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, that choose the things that please me. We need to choose the things that please him and take hold of my covenant. In the New Testament, we choose the things that please him as we walk in the New Testament ways. And we take hold of the covenant promises and his ways and walk in it. You've got to be sure that you're choosing the things that please the Lord. Remember Mary over in Luke chapter 10? Remember with Mary and Martha? We pick up over here in verse... 38, 
came to pass, he went and entered into a certain village. A certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She was the wise one. She said, I need to hear his word, and sat at the master's feet. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. You need to choose to not let yourself get busy and all cumbered, worried, troubled about all kinds of things. You cast the care on the Lord, God will help you to do all the things you need to do. But you need to sit at the Master's feet. You need to be hearing the Word of God. You've got to get what is the good part in you, which shall not be taken away from her. Put God's Word first place in your life. In Colossians chapter 3, that's the ones that God is going to choose. Colossians chapter 3, down here in verse 12. He says, put on, therefore, and the word put on is the word enduo, which means to sink into clothing. And this is talking about you clothing yourself, actually. When we look at this, because it happens to be in the middle voice, the middle voice, which means you're doing it for yourself. It's also an imperative mood, which means it's a command. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion to you. Do the best you can. No. He's commanded you. Clothe yourselves. Therefore, as the elect of God, and who are the elect? The chosen ones. If you're, gonna fulfill, if you're really going to be chosen because you're the chosen of God, but are you going to do what he says so that you will then experientially be chosen and shown to be found to obey what he tells you to do? You need to do what he says. Put on, clothe yourself as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, which means holding up one another, not running them down, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, love, agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. Therefore, these are things that you're commanded to clothe yourself with as the elect of God. You're chosen to do this. And if you're going to be approved of him, we need to obey him. He wants you to be merciful. Blessed are those that will be merciful. You, you be merciful, you'll obtain mercy. Kindness. Humility. He resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Meekness. That's a submissiveness, a yieldedness unto the Lord, a lowliness, a gentleness. Long-suffering. Not having a short fuse, getting upset so easily. God wants you to be long-suffering in every situation. Forbearing, holding up one another not running them down, not being quick to judge, criticize, forbearing one another, forgiving, always forgive a person. Remember, if you don't forgive a person, you're not forgiven of your own sins, and you are going to abide in your own sins and see destruction as you're turned over to the tormentors. Also, you need to put on love. That's the new commandment he given us, remember, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. You must walk in love if you are going to be approved of God. We see over in 2 Peter, chapter 1, here in verse 10, it says this. We saw the scripture when we were talking about the calling of God, but this one also comes along with the being chosen of God. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election, which is the word, again, for being chosen, different form of it, make it sure. In other words, your calling and election is not sure, stable, fast, and firm unless you give diligence to do what he says to make it sure. See, these people that think, well, I've been chosen of God, so everything's going to be automatic. Oh, no. You're chosen of God to do the things he says, and he's going to find out whether you're going to obey him and do it. Well, what are all these things, he says, that we need to do? He says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. What's he talking about? Well, we go back here, and we see the fact that grace and peace will be multiplied into us through the knowledge of God. And we talk about the knowledge of God. This is the word epigenosis, which means precise and correct knowledge. Not what you think it says or what so-and-so says. You've got to know what it says. I mean, you're going to have to look at the Scriptures and study out the Scriptures and look up the words. Because if you follow the blind, both, you know, fo blind follow the blind, they both fall in the ditch. And you're not going to say, well, so-and-so said it was such. It ain't going to work. 
You got to study and check things out for yourself. You got to search the scriptures to see if it's so. So we got to get the exact, precise knowledge of God, which means it's going to take time and effort on your part to study the Word. According to His divine powers given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, everything that He, it would, everything we have need of in life, through the knowledge of Him that's called us to glory and virtue. So you got to get the knowledge of God whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. What are we supposed to do with those? We're supposed to possess them. They're given to you legally in Christ. All the promises of God are yea and in him amen, 2 Corinthians 1.20. And you've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We read that scripture in Ephesians 1.3. Well, you got these promises. You're supposed to be a partaker of them and take hold of those promises and see them come to pass in your life. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. See, you're not a partaker of the divine nature until you possess the promises. In the measure that you possess the promises of God is the measure that you have become a partaker of the divine nature. Because when you become a partaker of the divine nature, you're going to bring forth God's fruit from the Word of God, and you're also going to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Because you're not going to walk after the lust of the flesh. You're not going to walk in any of these ways of corruption. Instead, you're going to do what He says. So we're going to possess the promises. Besides this, giving diligence add to your faith, as you're going to operate by faith, virtue, which is moral excellence or moral goodness. If you are going to be one chosen of God, you've got to live morally right before the Lord. No excuse for walking in any of the vices of this world. And to virtue, knowledge. We gain knowledge. We're to grow in knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. Temperance is the word which means self-control. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control of the flesh. When you are walking in line with the Word, you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walking in the Word, in fact, what are you supposed to do about all the things of the flesh? The Bible says you're supposed to crucify the, that flesh daily. We take up our cross daily, crucifying the deeds, the, all the desires, affections, lusts of the flesh. You do that daily. You don't let your flesh run you. You are going to walk in the Spirit every day of your life. And to temperance, patience. Now, what's patience? It's the Greek word hupomone, as you see, which means steadfast or to be constant. Hupomone, being steadfast or conscience, constant, and patience is that which covers the area of your soul. Temperance deals with the flesh, the body. Patience deals with the soul. We know this, as we'll come back here in a moment, because of Luke chapter 21, in verse 19, where it indicates what patience does. In your patience, hupomone, possess ye your souls. You're going to keep your soulless realm in control, in line with the Word of God, when you're steadfast, constant upon the Word of God. And what's the soulless realm? Your will, intellect, and emotions. You've got to keep the Word of God ruling over your emotions. Don't let whatever comes and some emotion comes up and you react to it get you to walk in the ways of sin. No, you need to have the Word of God. Instead of reacting about how you feel, think, what does the Word say about this before you go reacting according to your feelings? You've got to govern the soul realm through the Word, and that's exactly what patience will do, is you're going to be steadfast. We see here, then, to patience, which is covering the soul, godliness. Godliness is showing a reverence to God, a respect to Him. And when we study out godliness, what we've talked about in the past, it comes from being a hearer and a doer of the Word of God. See, godliness is to increase, but you're going to have ungodliness increase as well, as the Bible says. That's because you don't do the Word of God. He goes on and says to godliness, brotherly kindness, showing love to the brotherhood and the brothers and sisters in Christ. We should always be showing love to all brothers and sisters in Christ, reaching out to them. This is Philadelphia, where we get the word, our city from, which is brotherly love. And philio is the word which means a fondness, a friendship for. That's what we show. We show a fondness and a friendship for those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the next, it says charity, which is agape, which is love towards everybody. And this love is a love which realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the worth of an individual. Everybody is valuable, precious, and of great worth. Show, so we show love towards them. That doesn't mean that we're going to do whatever they want to do or fellowship with them. No, we're just going to show love to them because if they're not walking right with the Lord, you're not going to have fellowship with them. You're going to minister to them, but you're not going to be in fellowship to them. It goes on and says, if these things be in you and abound, 
they're not only supposed to be in you, they're supposed to be abounding. That means they're supposed to be increasing. They're to be uh, continually increasing and abounding in your life. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you lack these things, you're blind. You cannot see afar off, and you've forgotten that you are purged from your old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. How are you going to be able to make your calling and election sure? You're going to get the exact knowledge, precise knowledge of the Word of God, and you're going to do what it says to take hold of the promises of God. You're going to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. You're going to walk by faith, and you are going to walk in line with the knowledge of God. You're going to have moral excellence. You're going to be having self-control, temperance over the flesh, patience, steadfastness over the soul, walking in godliness, hearing and doing the word, showing absolute respect and reverence for God in all that you do, showing brotherly kindness to all those in the body of Christ, walking in love at all times, and this is all to be increasing and abounding in your life. Because you'll make your call and election sure, steadfast and firm. If, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Praise God. We want to be sure that we're doing the right things. And again, when this word says you'll never fall, Remember that this is all conditional. How do we know it's conditional? Because it's a subjunctive mood. It would be better have been translated that you might never fall. Not that you shall. Shall means it's an automatic done deal. It's not a good translation. It should have been might because it's aorist tense. Young's translates it may never fall, which is usually the way you translate when it's present tense. But it's aorist. It would be better translated that you might never fall if the conditions are met. So, what's that tell you? Hey, you and I got to make sure our calling and our choosing is sure. It's not sure just because you've been born again. That throws that old once saved, always saved, everything's fine forever, you know, right out the window because it's been a lying teaching. We need to walk in the ways of the Lord. Well, you see something else over in Hagehi. Over in Hagehi, we see in chapter 2. We'll begin first in chapter 1, down in verse 8. He says, Go up to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house. I'll take pleasure in it, and I'll be glorified, saith the Lord. What's supposed to be built? He's talking here about the house. What are we supposed to build our own, our own life? The spiritual house, or our being, build up the spiritual house of God in us. He said here, You look for much, and lo, it came to little. Everything that they were doing, they were sowing, they were reaping nothing. You brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because my house is waste, and every man's running to his own house. Otherwise, he's doing his own thing and doing, instead of doing what God wants. You've got to be doing what God wants and building his house, not your house. And so what happened? No blessings. The heaven over them was stayed from dew. Uh, the earth was stayed from her fruit. No fruitfulness. They had a drought upon the land. Everything was just in terrible shape. Zerubbabel, the son of Zetiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant, this is a remnant who were responding, obeyed the voice of the Lord. What is God looking for for you? To obey the voice of the Lord. Begin to build the house of God in you. And it says the people did fear before the Lord. They had the fear of God before them. They would choose the fear of the Lord. And he went on and spoke to them and says, I am with you. See, those people that will obey him, and walk in the fear of the Lord, God will be with them, and he will be at work to build the house of God in you. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Jetiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant. Again, the remnant are the ones who are responding to the call of God, of the people. They came and did work in the house of the Lord. You've got to realize you and I are responsible to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You are to get to work in doing the things that God says as you walk in line with his ways. Well, we see you come over in chapter 2, and we come down here to verse 2. And again, he's speaking again to Zerubbabel and to Joshua and the residue, which is the same thing, the remainder or the remnant of the people. And he speaks about how, who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Talking about the early church, where it was great glory. How do you see it now? Not too glorious. Is it not in your eyes, com comparison of it, as nothing? That's right. Yet be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, O Joshua. Be strong, all ye people of the land. Otherwise, what's going to be necessary if we're going to see God move mightily and see the glory of God come into the church? You've got to get strong. 
If you're sitting there waiting for God to just pour out His glory and just drop it on you from heaven, you'll wait forever and you'll never see it happen. You're going to have to get strong in the Lord, in the power of His might, by putting on the whole armor of God and get the Word in you. And work. You've got to get to work. You can't just sit around doing nothing. You need to get to work every day doing the things that God has told you to do in His Word in your own life, as well as doing the work of God and ministering to others. Remember, he says, for I am with you. And he goes on, he says that he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. It's going to be a mighty shaking. I'm going to shake all nations. And what's he going to do? He says, I'm going to fill this house with the glory. It's going to happen for the end time church that the glory of God is going to be filling the house. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. This is what he purposes. And this is going to be for the ones that he chooses, that he chooses because they've obeyed him. Now we come down farther to verse 21. And he says again, I'll shake the heavens and the earth. I'll overthrow the thrones of kingdoms, destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, overthrow the chariots and those that ride him, and the horse and riders will come down, every one by the sword of his brother. That's talking about God destroying all the enemies, and he'll destroy all the enemies in your life as well. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I'll take thee, O Zebrabel, my servant, the son of Jetiel, saith the Lord, I'll make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee. A signet, or like a signet ring for one who has won the victory and is going to rule and reign. Of course, that's Jesus. And who's going to be with them? All the ones that have gotten strong, all the ones that have worked out their own salvation, all the ones that have built the house of God. Why? Because they have been chosen of the Lord. We want to be those who are building our house, hearing and doing the word, obeying, fear, have the fear of God, be strong, be working the work of God in our life so that we can be filled with the glory of God and also conquering the enemy in our life so that we can be chosen of the Lord. Now, the ones that God chooses, we see there's been conditions that we've already seen. But we see back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, over here in verse 6, he says this, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. A holy people. You're going to have to walk in holiness if you're going to be chosen of the Lord. Special people above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Well, that's what we need to be. It goes on and says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any people, but you are the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because you would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, as the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Otherwise, who is going to be chosen? The holy people that are keeping covenant and mercy with him. And who are those? The ones that love him. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. You're going to keep the commandments of the Lord. We see that, of course, over in the New Testament as well. Another point is that those who are going to be chosen are those that are going to be holy before God. There was a contention with the Israelites between Moses and Korah and the ones that were following him. And here Moses spoke to Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy. Those are the ones that are his. Who is holy and will cause him to come near unto them. Even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Otherwise, the person that's really his, the person that's really holy, that's the one that he's going to choose. And of course, the result was he chose Moses and Korah. That was the end for him. He said, put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow and be that the man whom the Lord to choose, he shall be holy. Otherwise, God's going to show who's the holy one. Well, Korah was in rebellion, see. What happened to him? Here, the ground clave asunder that was under them. The earth opened her mouth, swallowed them up, their houses and all the men that pertain in the core and all their goods. They and all that appertain to them went down alive into the pit. That's quite an amazing thing. And the earth closed upon them. God opened the earth and they went straight down in the pit of hell and closed the thing up. And they perished from among the congregation. They weren't chosen. Why? Because they were not holy before the Lord. You and I need to be holy before him. Well, it says he knows the ones that are his. Well, who are the ones that are really his? We can see over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
it says over here in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth him, them that are his. Who's the ones that are his? Not just everybody that's born again automatically is his. He goes on and says, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The ones that are really his are the ones that are going to be holy, right? And those are the ones that are going to depart from iniquity. And the word iniquity is the word adakia, which means unrighteousness. What does unrighteousness produce? Uh, what does sin produce? It produces unrighteousness. Are you going to be <clears throat> holy if you have sin in your life and all this unrighteousness? No. So they need to depart from, the name of, uh, from all the unrighteousness if we name the name of Christ. Verse 20 said, In a great house there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Well, what determines which one you are? Say, well, God's the one that makes us that way. That's right, but you have a part to play. Because verse 21 says, If a man therefore purge, cleanse out thoroughly himself from these, from all the unrighteousness, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Who are the ones that are chosen? The ones that are his, the ones that are holy, the ones that are vessels of honor that have been sanctified, that have purged themselves from all the evil in their life. We see also, who does God choose? Well, he wants to, he's going to choose the ones that are going to do what he says. Remember they were choosing the ones to fight against the Midianites? Here was Gideon. And Judges chapter 7, verse 3, he said, Now therefore go to and proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. There were 32,000 people that showed up. 22,000 were sent home because they had fear. That's two-thirds, more than two-thirds. That's to also the truth in the body of Christ today. A great a number of the body of Christ has a lot of fear in their life that they are not, have not dealt with and they're not fit for the battle. So they had to return. And then he says, the people are yet too many. Bring them down in the water and I'll try them for thee there. It shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go with thee. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. A number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink the water. Otherwise, they got their mouth down in there. Now, if you're drinking the water and you're all the way down in the water, can you see what's going on around you? No. But the ones that took the water and brought it up to their mouth, they could also see what was going on as they were drinking. What's that show? They were watching so that they weren't going to be surprised or deceived by the enemy. The Bible says we're to watch and pray so we don't enter into the temptation. Therefore, these guys all got sent home and there were only 300 of them that were fit for the battle. If you have fear, if you're not watchful, watching and praying, you're not going to be fit for the battle. And you're not going to be chosen to see what God wants to accomplish in your life. And you'll never enter into the ministry that he has for you if you have fear and you're not watchful of the enemy. So many have tried to enter into the things of the ministry and they haven't been watchful. And the devil's just beaten them up left and right and knocked them out. Uh, You've got to be watchful. It should not be happening. First Samuel chapter 2, down here in verse 26. Speaking of Samuel, it says, Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And here there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? He says, Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? He chose this one, see, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire? of the children of Israel. This is talking about Samuel. What was the thing about Samuel? Samuel's one who sought after God. He's one that grew in the things of God. He got favor both with the Lord and with man. And also it speaks of him the fact that he was a faithful one. Because after these guys died because of Eli's sin and Hophni and Phinehas' sin, it says, I'll raise up a faithful priest who will do according to all that which is in my heart, in my mind, and I'll build him a sure house, and he'll walk before my anointed forever. Of course, that's all pointing towards Jesus prophetically. 
But who was the faithful church of, of priest that was raised up? Samuel. Samuel was faithful. That shows the fact that those who are called and are going to be chosen of God are going to have to seek after God. They're going to have to grow in favor through the knowledge of God, hearing and doing it, with God and with man. And they're also going to have to be obedient and be found faithful. Those are the ones that are going to be chosen of the Lord. We see something else about who God chooses. He also looks upon your heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 talks about how the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I've refused him. See, it might look to the outward, this guy should be chosen. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That shows you something. If you are going to be chosen of God, you're going to have a heart that's right with him. He is looking at what is in your heart. Well, when he went through all of them, he said this, we can't not chosen one after another after another. And now he finally comes to verse 12. He sent him and brought him in. This is when he brought in David. He says, now he was ready and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. He's the last one they brought in. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of the brethren. The spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. God looks after the heart. God's looking at your heart. Now, don't fall for that little Christian cliche that says, well, God knows my heart, even though we got all this wickedness going on and sin and negative things. Yeah, he knows your heart. You got big time problems. If your heart's, if you haven't got the fruit coming forth, you got a problem in your heart. Because evidence of your walk and what's in your heart is going to be shown by the fruit in your life. Remember, the Bible says no good thing we hold from those that walk uprightly. That's because they're going to have a perfect heart. David was one who had a perfect heart before the Lord. God wants you to have a perfect heart before him. And then he's going to bring blessings upon you. Further, even talking about David, what showed the fact that he had a perfect heart before him? Because he was obedient. And he did what God wanted to do. 1 Kings chapter 11, down here in verse 34. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand. I'll make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, sake whom I chose. Why? Because he kept my commandments and my statutes. If God sees that you are going to keep his word, keep his commandments and statutes, do what he says, then he's going to take notice of you. And then he's going to choose you. And that is important in your life. We also see in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, who else does God choose? In verse 12, it makes this statement. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I've heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Otherwise, what was supposed to be the place where they were to be? They were supposed to be people that were praying, and he chose this place as a house of sacrifice. So, that shows the fact that God's choosing those who are going to pray. As you pray and you seek God, because you and I are a house of prayer, and we are to be offering up sacrifices as we are praying and doing what God wants us to do, He's going to place His name on there. He's going to choose the ones who are going to enter in because you are called to be a house of prayer. Talks about that in Matthew 21. We saw, talked about that in the past. You are a house of prayer, and he expects you to enter into it. God's looking for you to be a prayer warrior for the Lord. He goes, that's why he goes in verse 14, and he's saying, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You begin to pray, God's going to move. And we prayed this prayer tonight, speaking this word. You need to be praying. God is wanting you to be a house of prayer those are the ones that he's going to choose, the people that are going to enter in to what he tells you to do. Here's another situation with Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7. God chose Abraham. Why? It says 9, 7, he brought him forth out of the earth of the Chaldees, gave him the name of Abraham, and found his heart faithful before thee. That's why he chose Abraham. He just didn't choose him arbitrarily. He found his heart faithful. God is looking at your heart. If he finds that you are faithful, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. If you can't be faithful in little things, you won't be faithful in much. That's why you need to be faithful in doing the things. And you want to see promotion from the Lord? Get faithful in the things that he's telling you to do right now. 
he will promote you in due time. In Isaiah, though, we see there were problems. He had those that were not doing what he said. They weren't obeying him. In Isaiah chapter 65, we see down here in verse 10, or verse uh, 12, it says, Therefore will I number you to the sword, you'll all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you didn't answer. That's someone that's not hearkening to him. When I spake, you did not hear. They ignored him. But you did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. You can't think that God's going to bless you if you don't choose the things that please him, or things that he is not delighted in. If you're a real servant of the Lord, you're really following him, you're going to choose what he wants you to do in every situation. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, they'll be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, they'll be thirsty. Behold, uh, my servants shall rejoice, and you shall be ashamed. You'll be thirsty, hungry, and ashamed. Why? Because they weren't walking right. But the real servants, they're the ones that are going to be blessed, the ones that choose the way of the Lord. But these people that choose what I delight not in, you're not going to see God's blessing come forth. See, if you're not seeing blessings, don't sit there and think God's holding anything back. There's a reason. There's a reason why things aren't happening. Isaiah 66, we see the same principle wrought out. Verse 3 and 4. Here it says in the last part, he says, They've chosen their own ways. Their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions. You choose the wrong way, God's going to choose your delusions, bring your fears upon you, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they didn't hear. They did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Same thing. He says it again. That's why it's important that you choose the things that God wants you to choose. If you choose what He wants, then you're going to be chosen of God, and you're going to be blessed of the Lord. You know, when they were choosing people who were going to handle the ministration, when the the murmuring arose because of the windows and the neglecting of the daily ministration in Acts chapter 6. What did they do? Here it says, Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They just didn't say, Oh, find somebody to just do this thing. No. They said, Find somebody full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. That's not your average guy out there. That's somebody who's got God in him. God wants you to get full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And what happened? Stephen was one of the ones chosen. He was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. He wants you to get full of faith, not on quarter, not on half, not on empty. You need to get full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. How's that going to happen? Because you're in the Word and you're hearing and doing the Word and working the Word, and you're also praying, which causes a filling of the Holy Spirit, and you're praising and worshiping God, you're praying in tongues, you're doing all the things that bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, you got to do the things that cause this to come to pass in your life. Now over in Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, we see here a parable that Jesus spoke. And he talked about a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Sent forth the servants, called them that were bidden to the wedding. They wouldn't come. Tried to find more to come to the marriage. They wouldn't come. They had all their excuses. One had to go to his farm, another had to do, do other things. And they got mad about it, and they slew this one. Well, the king heard of it. He went, sent forth his armies, destroyed the murderers, and burned up the city. He said, here, the wedding's ready. They were bidden, were not worthy. Otherwise, people that are called are not going to be chosen for the wedding if they're not found worthy before the Lord. He said, go there on the highways, and many as you find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out in the highways, gathered all they could find, both good and ba bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Well, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man that had not on a wedding garment. What's a wedding garment? White and clean, isn't it? He didn't have a wedding garment on. He said, friend, how camest thou in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. If you don't have a wedding garment on, you're in trouble. He said, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The wedding garment, of course, is the fact that you get the Spirit of Jesus Christ and you're born again, but it's more than that. It's not just because you're born again does that mean that you have a clean, white wedding garment on. Look what it says over in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4. He says, Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, for they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Those are the ones who are walking clean and white. It says those are the ones that are worthy 
they were walking right. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, which is righteousness. I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life. That's quite a statement, isn't it? That means he, can, he could blot somebody's name out. That thing that says, when my name is written in the book of life, so everything's fine forever. Well, this shows the fact that a person's name could be blotted out. That's why here we see very clearly we can't be letting our garments get defiled. We've got to walk worthy of the Lord. We see another scripture over in Revelation which even shows us how important this is. Because in Revelation 19.7, look what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's what we're looking for. But we're going to be united together with Jesus. And his wife really not the best translation because the same word for wife is the same word for woman. First of all, if the marriage hasn't happened, then he's not his wife yet. It should have been translated woman. The woman, which is who's the woman? Talking about the bride to be, who is who? The church. Hath made herself ready. She got prepared and ready. Well, how did she do that? To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. If she made herself ready, that means she was clean, pure, holy, white. That meant she got rid of all the stain. Anything would stain her. See, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all of our sins are a scarlet will be white as snow, it talks about in Isaiah. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Otherwise, if we're going to be one of those that are going to be chosen, then we're going to be one that's going to be white, we're going to be clean, we're going to be walking in his ways, seeing righteousness come forth. Well, remember, here's what it says here. It says about what happened to him. Then the next verse is what's very important. Many are called, but few are chosen. Who is the ones that are chosen? The ones that have the wedding garment on, the ones that are clean, the ones that are not defiled, the ones that are righteous, the ones that are holy before the Lord. And that's what God wants. That means we've got to deal with all sin in our life. We've got to walk in His ways so we'll be chosen of Him. Matthew chapter 20, down here in verse 16, says, The last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. In this context, it's talking about those that were laborers. Or the laborers, if you go back here, he's talking about those that he went out and hired laborers into the vineyard. And they went out and they were out in the vineyard being a laborer. You've been called. You're to be a laborer for God. You know, the laborers are few. Be sure that you're a laborer for Him. That's why you ought to be talking to people about Jesus, passing out tracts, get the good news for you that we have, pass them out, give them out, so you can get the gospel in the hands of people. You and I are responsible to preach the gospel, and we've got to be doing it. You've got to realize that God is looking for a people that will be a remnant that will walk in His ways. Those are the ones He's going to choose. Is he looking for the high and mighty out there? No. Look to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world, with things that are despised, has God chosen. Yea, the things that are not, to bring to naught things that are. He's just looking for a people that are going to be yielded unto him. We see another scripture. In James chapter 2, verse 5. See, that's why the world, they can't understand. They think it's only supposed to be the high and mighty that are supposed to be chosen. No. James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love them? What's the conditions? You're going to have to love him. You love the Lord, the kingdom is going to come to you. That's the rule and the reign of God. God is going to choose those that love him that are going to walk in His ways. That's anybody who's going to yield unto the Lord. Now, how about for the one that God chooses? What's going to happen for the ones that God chooses? When we look at what happens, those people that have been chosen by the Lord, God is manifesting Himself in them and through them. First Chronicles 15, 2, David said, None ought to carry the ark of the God but the Levites, for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto Him forever. Who are the Levites? Those are the priests, and the priests that were sanctified. When you talk, let's see how, what the priests had to be done. They had to be sanctified. They had to carry all the filthiness out. We know that because of the fact of what it talks about. Um, 
We talked about this further earlier where uh, in previous messages where he told them that they were supposed to call all the priests, they were to bring them in to the place and they were to go into, into the, into the, into the uh, inner court and bring out all the filthiness that they found in the inner court. Everything, every, all the filth had to be brought out so that then they would be holy before the Lord. And what was the result? They carried the ark of God and ministered for him. That's the presence of God. You want to see the manifest presence of God? You're going to have to be a priest that's doing the things of God and walking in his ways. We see in Psalm 65, Psalm 65 here, he says in verse 4, we're seeing who's the one that's going to be chosen of God. Blessed is the man whom thou chosest, causes to approach unto thee. He may dwell in thy courts, he be, will be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. See, what's God going to do? He's going to come, up, come and make his abode in you. He's going to manifest, he's going to come and dwell in you. You know, just like it talks about in John 14, the person who has his commandments and keeps them, he's the one that God loves. He says, we're going to come and make our abode with him. When a God comes to make his abode in you, you're going to be satisfied with the goodness, all the blessings of God. You're going to dwell in the presence of God and see God's great blessings come upon you. We even see another principle brought out in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, we see over here in verse 17. He says, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelled as strangers in the land of Egypt and with a high arm brought, them, brought he them out of it. Whoever God chooses, he'll exalt them and he'll bring them out of bondage. Well, if he chooses you, he's going to exalt you if you meet the conditions and he's going to bring you out of all bondage in your life. You'll come out of everything. We even also see the one who's been chosen of God, God's going to fight for you against your enemies. In Luke chapter 8, 18, where in verse 1 it says that how men must, necessary, must, it's translated, always pray and not to faint. Down in verse 7 it says this, Shall not God avenge his own elect? Who's the elect? The chosen ones, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. What's God going to do? He's going to avenge you against your enemies crying long to him as those that are crying out for help for him. When we pray, we're coming to the Lord as our source. And what's he going to do? He's going to avenge. He's going to show vengeance and punishment against your enemies, which are all the evil spirits, and destroy them and see them be put underfoot. It's very important that you meet these conditions to be chosen because it speaks about the chosen in the last days in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22. It says, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. For, but for the elects, the chosen's sake, these days shall be shortened. But then he says in verse 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. They'll show great signs and wonders. Don't follow signs and wonders. If you follow signs and wonders, you could be deceived because it says that false prophets and false cross Christ will be able to do this. They're going to do it by demonic power. They can do healings and all kinds of things. Insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. If you follow after signs and wonders, you could be deceived, even though you're one of the elect walking in God's ways. That's why you got to guard yourself. Don't be following signs and wonders. So many Christians, they do this all the time. Somebody has a sign and wonder ministry, they flock to the people. That's a mistake. They better check them out and find out what's good and what's not right. Because they didn't fa do this, that so-called Lakeland Revival, that was all these so-called signs and wonders, and the guy was com communicating with the Emma O, the female angel, who of course is not an angel, it was a demon because angels are all male. And this guy was doing all these signs and wonders that were happening, but it was by demonic power. And at the same time, the guy was committing adultery with someone at the very same time the revival was going on and ended up divorcing his wife and is now married to her and somebody's trying to restore, has restored him back into his ministry, supposedly. You think that's all God? No, not a bit. That's a line, signs and wonders. And people from all over the world and countries were flocking to this, this so-called revival. Well, God got rid of it, knocked the thing all out. But I'll tell you, you've got to watch that you don't follow after these kinds of things. Verse 31, 
Here he talks about, he's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and gather together his elect. That's right, the chosen ones, we're going to be gathered together and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Who's that going to be? The same ones that are without blame, without spot, that are holy, without blemish before him, unrebukable and unreprovable, that are chosen and proved of God because they're walking in the ways of the Lord. And you also see, who else is... Who else does it speak of here in Revelation that it's, they're coming back with Jesus when he comes in his second coming? Revelation 17, 14. Look what it says. These shall make war with the Lamb. Let's talk about when Jesus comes back. The Lamb shall overcome them, of course. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. But who's with them? Everybody who's just a born-again Christian? Doesn't say that. They that are with them are called, chosen, and faithful. Not just called only, called and chosen. Not just called and chosen. Remember those that made their calling and election sure, steadfast, because they do the things so that they'll never fall? They're the ones that are faithful. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. Those are the ones that are going to be chosen by God and are going to be with him when he comes back. That's why you and I got to be in that company. So what have we seen? We've seen tonight that God chooses those who meet the conditions. You've been chosen from the foundation of the world as far as what he purposes for you, but it's not manifest in your life unless you meet the conditions. The conditions are we need to be believers in Christ, of course, walking in his ways, holy without blame, fruit with our fruit remaining, not was here once. That's just like the guy, remember, in, in Mark, Mark, Matthew chapter 7, who was doing all these mighty works of the Lord. You know, he's casting out demons, did all these wonderful works. And yet, when he heard, you know, God spoke to him and said that you're doing or doing iniquity, which was lawlessness, he said, depart from me. Otherwise, he was walking right once. I'll give you the scripture just so you can see it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, 22. He says, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord's entering the kingdom of heaven. That's right. But he that doeth the will of my Father, doing, present tense, continuous, repeated in the Greek. Many will say to me, that isn't a few, that's a lot. This is pretty heavy. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? They had the Holy Spirit, didn't they? They were born again. In my name have cast out devils. They knew their authority. They were actually casting out demons. In my name done many wonderful works. They did things in the name of Jesus. These were born-again Christians. They weren't unsaved people. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. The reason is because once a person is turned away from righteousness and back in, in, unto unrighteousness, all remembrance of their righteousness is wiped out. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness, anomia. And they weren't just working it for a moment. They were working it continually, as you see. Present tense, continuous, repeated action. What's that show you? That's why our fruit's got to remain. Our fruit remaining shows the fact that we've been walking right with the Lord. Just even to show you that scripture, for some of you who may not have been here when we talked about righteousness, uh, this is one of them. Where it talks, I think it's this one. They were accusing him of doing of, of uh, unequal, being unequal. Let's see if I can find the exact scripture. Maybe it was before that. Yeah. When the righteous, Ezekiel 18:24. This is important to understand about righteousness. When the righteous, that's a guy who's been walking right, right, turns away from his righteousness. Now he's not walking right. He's walking in lawlessness, unrighteousness. Now, commits iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness that he hath done in the past shall not be remembered, is what the word means. Not mentioned, shall not be remembered. It will not be remembered. It's like it's wiped away. That's why Jesus said, I don't know you. I never knew you. Because it was all wiped away in one shot because of the fact that they turned away from the Lord. You've got to understand why that's so in Matthew chapter 7. And he said, depart from me. So, 
We've got to be fruitful with fruit remaining. We need to also come out of the world. We need to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. We need to submit to the Lordship of Jesus and let His rule and reign come in our life. These are all things we've seen tonight. We need to fight our spiritual battles. We need to choose life and blessing, loving the Lord, obeying His voice, cleaving unto Him and serving Him. We need to walk in the way of truth and hear and do His word. We need to choose the fear of the Lord. We can't be walking in the ways of sin and think that we're going to be right. We've got to get wisdom and understanding, refuse the evil and choose the good. Choose the things that please God and take hold of the covenant and choose the good part of hearing the word of God like Mary did. We're to put on mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, holding others up, forgiving them, and walking in love. We're to get knowledge, faith, moral excellence, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly love, love all established in us with fruit abounding so that then we make our calling and election sure and steadfast because as we do these things, we'll never fall. We're going to build our house, obey, have the fear of God, be strong in work as we saw in Hagehi. No fear of the enemy. We're going to get filled with glory. We overthrow the enemies. We're going to be chosen of the Lord. We're going to keep the commandments of God. Remember we saw all those that were in fear, they weren't selected. If you're not watchful of the enemy, it means he's going to take you down. You're going to end up walking in sin. The only ones that were chosen were the ones that had no fear and were, not, were watchful of the enemy when we're talking about Gideon, the 300 that were chosen. Seeking God, growing in knowledge, favor, having a right heart, keeping the commandments, being a person of prayer, faithful heart, being a servant, walk, not walking in your own way, but walking in His way, being full of faith in the Holy Spirit and power. These are all qualities of the people that were chosen. Clean heart, white, righteous, not defiled, walking worthy of the Lord, being a laborer for Him, and engaging in spiritual warfare, conquering the enemies in our life. And what are we going to see? We're going to see that we're going to be carrying the presence of God. We're going to be blessed. We're going to be satisfied with the goodness of the Lord. We're going to be exalted and delivered out of bondage. We're going to be avenged of our enemies. We're not going to be deceived by the false prophets because we're not going to follow the signs and the wonders. We're going to look at the truth and the fruit and see who's really true and who's not. And we're going to be the called, the chosen, and the faithful. That's quite a statement of what you see in the Word of God. And I'll just, again, bring this scripture that we looked at from the very beginning over here in Matthew chapter 22. We looked at 20, and this is the other one, 22, verse 14. Many are called, few are chosen. And remember, he said, many in that day are going to say all these things. That's why we're going to be one of the remnant. We're going to be walking straight and narrow. We're going to be one of those that are going to be chosen of God because we respond to the call of God. We're obedient. We walk in His ways. And if you just choose to put God's word first place and do what He says, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be a remnant. But if you walk in your own way, you won't be chosen of the Lord. Remember the sheep, they're chosen. Enter in to the joy of the Lord and life eternal and the righteous. What about the goats? Wandered off their own way. You're out of here in the everlasting darkness. Pretty heavy statements, but that's the word of God and that is the reality and the truth. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that I have a call and I have been chosen from the foundation of the world, but I'm to answer that call and do what God says so that I will show I'm worthy of being chosen by the Lord. I understand many are called, but few are chosen. I will be a part of the remnant that is going to do all these things and I will be chosen of the Lord, and I will be with the Lord. I'll be one of the ones that's called, chosen, and faithful with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm one of the remnant because I'm a doer of your word. Thank you, Lord. I will make sure my calling and election is sure, steadfast, and stable. Because I will do the things of the Word of God, and I will never fall. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.